I'm Tom Tomich, the director of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute at UC Davis. And before we hear from this year's award recipient and from our distinguished speaker, I'd like to make an announcement that's become sort of an annual tradition here for us at UC Davis. And I think reading these things out also serves as a, as a good reminder to the ASI director to keep grounded and, and keep it real. So five years ago, the Bradford and the Rominger families came together to establish the Eric Bradford and Charlie Rominger Agricultural Sustainability Leadership Award. Today is the third time we've presented the award, which honors <coughs> two outstanding people. One, Eric Bradford gave 50 years of service to UC Davis building programs in animal science and agricultural sustainability. Particularly relevant today, Eric was the architect in many ways of what became both ASI and our undergraduate major in sustainable agriculture and food systems. And last year we saw the first two graduates in that Bachelor of Science degree program awarded their degrees, and we now are at over 50 students in that major. The other person we're honoring here today is Charlie Rominger, a fifth generation Yolo County farmer who was a leader in sustainable agricultural practices, farmland preservation, wildlife habitat restoration, and many, many other issues and efforts. Now next Tuesday, we're going to have our annual field day at the Russell Ranch Sustainable Agriculture Facility, where there's a new science plan that for our century experiment that aims to increase food supply while reducing the negative effects of agriculture on the environment. And I know that those are goals that both Eric and Charlie would embrace, and they not only would approve, but I, I really feel that they continue to shape our work in these areas in many ways. One of those is in giving this award. And in doing so, we recognize and honor individuals who exhibit leadership, the work ethic and the integrity epitomized by Eric and Charlie. And I just want to say specifically three points about what we look for in making this award because we take the process very seriously. This award recognizes a person who has a broad understanding of agricultural systems and the environment, takes the long view, and aims high to make a difference in the world. This person's work in agriculture and its sustainability is both science-based and grounded in reality. This award honors the recipient's high standards of integrity, service, and respect for all. It also affirms the selflessness of the recipient, who is focused on achieving a good outcome, not personal credit. I'm pleased that we have here today our inaugural recipient, Kelly Garbaugh. I did that. Kelly. Two years ago, Kelly was a, a graduate student, just finishing her doctorate in ecology, and now she's a faculty member at Loyola, Loyola University in Chicago. She's actually out here for this event, but also to do field work with colleagues here in the local it's also a pleasure to say that last year's recipient, Ken Tate, was planning to be here. There's Ken. Mm -hmm. Snuck in right at the end. So, so Ken is a UC Cooperative Extension Specialist in our Department of Plant Sciences here at UC Davis. And I just wanted to mention to all of you that you can see inspiring video interviews that were done with Kelly and with Ken on the ASI website. And part of the purpose of this award is to create a, a pantheon of leaders and examples of leaders to inspire the next generation. I also want to acknowledge just a few of the other members of this distinguished audience, in addition to the members of the Bradford, Rominger, and Ralph families who are here in the, in the front of the room. You're all here. It's a pleasure to see you here. But in addition to the families who endowed this award, um, I believe that Sandy Schubert was going to be here. I didn't see San Sandy, the Undersecretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, Don Bransford. Don't say Don. I know that Barbara Allen Diaz is here, Vice President of the UC Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And we also have Bill Lacey here today, who's Vice Provost for University Outreach and International Programs at UC. So we're very happy to have their participants, 
participation and, and all of you here. I also wanted to just mention that members of the se uh, selection committee who served uh, on this process. Uh, two of our ASI board members, Courtney Gallagher of Bank of America is here today. And also Judith Redman from Full Belly Farm served on the um, selection committee. This is a really busy season in an organic vegetable farm, so I don't, I don't think Judith was able to come. And there were three faculty colleagues in addition to myself on the selection committee. Um, Will Horwath, Neil Williams, and Hermias Cabrea, who, who is here today. There's Hermias from our animal science department. So in the past, We've sworn all the selection committee members to silence, and we waited until today to announce the presentation of the award and to announce uh, who's receiving the award. This year, we announced the recipient a week or so ago. Um, so most of you, I think, probably already know that Rose Hayden Smith is this year's award recipient. a few words about Rose before before I give her the microphone. It, it was was such a pleasant a pleasure to to share with people before today's ceremony that Rose Hayden Smith was selected for this event. And we we're able to hear from so many people about how much they appreciate Rose and see the alignment between her work and the principles that we want to celebrate today. Um, over and over, we heard how she displays the characteristics that ASI seeks to acknowledge in giving this award. And, and I understand that Twitter lit up when her video went live on the ASI website. <laughs> so, Rose has a distinguished record of leadership. She served UC Agriculture and Natural Resources as a cooperative extension, 4-H Youth Family and Community Development Advisor in Ventura County since 1992. She's the leader of Agriculture and Natural Resources Strategic Initiative in Sustainable Food Systems. She's also worked as a Cooperative Extension County Director, coordinated the Master Gardener Program, and worked with the UC Hansen Trust as Educational Program Coordinator. Rose also was a Kellogg Food and Society Policy Fellow, and she used that opportunity to focus on increasing community-based food security through gardening and urban agricultural programs. Rose is a professional historian. And remember when I read that out, taking the long view is part of the whole vision here. So I'm sure that Rose's long view illuminates things about the future as well. And that both Charlie and Eric would really be pleased that we have a historian receiving this award. As you can hear in her video on our website, Rose is an appreciative inquirer, and she's also a connector of people. And so I'm pleased to announce publicly, formally, what everybody already knows on Twitter, <laughs> that Rose Hayden Smith is this year's Bradford Rominger Award recipient. Please <laughs> Fiddlesticks. 
And um, I brought these because I want to share them with you later on, the fiddle sticks. And then I brought, of course, index cards. My daughter encouraged me to, um, to keep this really short by using images to talk about. So Charlie and Eric, they were big thinkers. They were, they were curious people. They were inquisitive people. And um, that is one of the things that historians do, is we ask questions. And um, so I am a scientist. I've been accused of not being a scientist. I actually, I'm a scientist. I study time. And I study the rate and the nature of change over time and what the impacts are. And history is a moving object and how we view it and, and things about it change all the time depending upon the context. And what I like to do is, is I like to look at the history of the food system and look at how we've done things in the past and use it as a launching pad to sort of inform how we might do things in the future. And so um, I, I am a, a scientist, just a, a temporal sort of scientist. Um, so let's see if I can figure out how to make this work. Okay, so one of the um, guiding theories um, of my work is the notion of consilience. And um, it's a theory, and, and what consilience is, is the unification of knowledge between different branches of learning. And it's literally a jumping together of knowledge. And um, when I found this definition about four years ago, I was doing some historical reading, and I found this reference to the work of, of William, it, it looks like Wewell, really, but it's, it's Huell, like Huell Hauser, William Huell. And um, he was a, 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 a British um, polymath. And he was a scientist, and he termed uh, this, this whole idea of consilience. He was a mentor to Charles Darwin. And in fact, Darwin um, quoted his treatise in, in the foreword to his own great work. And um, in addition to being a gifted scientist in a, a variety of disciplines, he was an author. He was a theologian. Um, he was an expert in architecture and languages, but mostly what he did was he insisted on classifying and unifying sciences and areas of knowledge so that there would be great thought and breadth across those areas. And when, when I did finally find this term, I felt that I had defined myself and I had never understood the way that I thought because I came from a family that um, the, the toys of, of choice were, they were erector sets, and they were heat kits, and, um, and we were motorized, and we were encouraged to build things that worked, that had motors, and that were electrified. Um, but in my mind, they were very linear. And um, so when I was young, I, I went to my cousin's house, and they had fiddle sticks. And um, so I, I advocated to my dad to buy fiddlesticks, and he kind of thought this was kind of a wimpy toy. Um, but what I really liked about it was that it, it's circular, and it has all these different places where you can plug things in. And so you could go at things from different angles. And so I realized in the last couple of weeks when I've been thinking about this that, that maybe my thinking is a fiddlestick. And that as we go forward and move towards the notion of sustainability and how we're going to achieve and sustain things um, in the current context, that this notion of consilience is vital because the issues are complex and they cross disciplines. And we're going to have to bring all the thinking together so have lots of different people um, in the room. So this idea of consilience, I think, becomes really important. And I think that in terms of, of leadership, I would really like to thank my, my boss, Barbara Allen Dias, because she has encouraged conciliar thinking in us. And um, I, I think in this position, especially as initiative leader, I would not have been um, a natural choice. I, I'm not an agronomist. And I, my, my doctorate is in social science. Um, but this idea of resilience and, and that we can take a different perspective. And I, I appreciate the opportunity in the university to be that kind of thinker and to have my work evolve over time. So I've told you about it earlier. So I do like social media, and there's been a reference to that. And one of the reasons I like social media is I think there's an opportunity 
um, just in technology in general. And my career before I came to the university, I spent seven years in the technology sector, basically being a translational person uh, between groups of um, scientists and engineers and consumers um, or companies that, that were purchasing internet-based products. And we would define it again, basically create interfaces for them. And that was my job. And so I worked with all these uh, former Stanford academics and, you know, and basically was the translational person. And so I, I love media, I love technology. So this hashtag fail. So I actually, um, I don't love to fail, but I'm a Phillies fan. And if you're a Phillies fan, you get kind of used to a sense of failure. They win 47% of the time. And there was actually a point last week where their season record actually matched their historical record. And then their best batting records actually go back to 1929, Lefty O'Doul, and 1930, the great Chuck Klein. And I've been a Phillies fan for a long time, because hashtag fail. So um, I grew up in a family that planned for failure, because my father was the technical director of the flight test programs at Edwards Air Force Base. And all he did, he spent his life setting up tests and trials that, you know, 50 of them would fail and then one would succeed. And so um, we came to have an understanding in our house and among our large family of children that it really wasn't that, that failure was a bad thing. It was an opportunity to reframe, to learn what had not gone well, what had gone well. And that was always the first examination. What, well, what went well after, you know, something crashed? Um, but also, there was never any um, there was never any recrimination or blame, because it was just accepted that to move forward, sometimes we had to fail, and that really the only failure where someone might in the family say you're failing is if you didn't get up and move forward or move, and the failure to do to do anything would would be considered failure. So. I am showing you these tennis shoes. Um, they're pretty beat up. So in 1972, when Title IX passed, I went to a small rural high school. Edwards is a pretty rural area. And they wanted to be on top of the Title IX stuff. So they put together a women's track team. And um, there weren't very many kids, so I got drafted. And the coach was our next door neighbor. And you know, I'm really slow. I'm not a track person, but it was like, it didn't matter. You're, 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 you're drafted. And you know, we sort of had this military mindset, we're drafted, and we'll do this as larger service to your school. So I found myself on the track team, and I was assigned to events. I was assigned to do the mile, and to do the mile relay. And what Coach Honeycutt, and you know, I thought he was ancient at the time, and now we're friends on Facebook, and it turns out he was like 10 or 15 years older than me. <laughs> I had no idea. I'm friends with all my high school teachers on Facebook, but they're all really young people. So like ancient at the time. Um, but what, what he told us was that you had to be strong, you had to endure, and you had to prepare because things were always going to be harder and take longer than you thought. And so what he would do every morning is the school had a station wagon. And we would go run along for school, because it gets hot out there, right? So we'd go early. And we would run along something called the Power Line Road, which wasn't even paved, just this huge, broad expanse of, uh, of sort of graded dirt. Um, you know, but really, really wide. It was where you learned how to drive. It was where you could drive really fast if your parents weren't around. Um, it was the kind of the cool thing with power lines. And so um, he would, you know, drive along in station wagon, drinking Dr. Pepper and eating chips for breakfast, um, which I've chided him on since, while we ran, and we ran, and we ran, and we ran. And what I learned from that is also something that I see in the work of Charlie and Eric, that it is the quiet work, it is the unseen work, it is the work done over years and years, the private conversations with people about change, that, that is how you move forward. Now, another thing too is I'm showing you this warrior pose, is um, Coach Honeycutt really insisted that we stretch and that we be flexible, not only to avoid injury, but he encouraged us to stretch and be flexible in our thinking and in our strategy as runners. Because in, especially in long races, there might be strategic opportunities 
that if you were flexible enough and quick enough and someone was having an off day, you know, that you might be able to sort of change your pace and dart ahead of them. Only happened to me like once or twice. I could think it, I just couldn't do it physically. I just wasn't very fast. Um, so it was kind of interesting though, um, was that, you know, I learned that sort of at the edge of a stretch, which is also something that I experience in yoga today, is that sometimes when you're at the edge of a stretch or the edge of a pose, if you can just sort of hang on for another second, it's when you have a breakthrough to a next level of performance. So this idea of flexibility and thinking, and um, one of the ways that I use technology is I use it to scan the environment. And so when I was a little kid on the tail end of a large family of kids who sort of were in a different generation, um, I have siblings that are quite a bit older, um, you know, they were watching Wagon Train and, you know, they all wanted to be Ward Bond. And I was like, you know, I don't want to be the Wagon Master, I want to be the Scout. I want to be out there seeing what's new and available and what we might anticipate. So that takes me to, to the next slide. For a non-athletic person, I'm showing you a lot of athletic things. Um, so these are relay batons. So the thing that Coach Honeycutt had us practice all the time is what he called the pass-off. So you're doing the relay. So I was always the second leg of the relay because I was the slowest one. And so he put the slowest person on the second leg because you couldn't do that much damage on the second leg. Um, but I was really good at pass-off. But he made us pass off repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And as I was thinking about that, um, I realize right now that in this sustainable agriculture field and this food systems movement, we're having a generational pass off right now. And when you're passing off, it's, it's you're passing off work and um, aspirations and ideas and experience. It's your greatest opportunity to get ahead, but it's also your greatest point of vulnerability. Because if you drop the baton, you're out of the race. And so by practicing and we learn to sort of intuit um, who was behind us and their timing and over the point of the year, we just were seamless at it. And the idea was that if you could do it right, you would launch that person that was running the next leg into just a trajectory that was unstoppable. And I wasn't the unstoppable one. It was Silky Schultz, who's still a friend of mine, who lives here in Sacramento, and then Carol Ryan, who broke all the county records. And she was the fastest miler in Kern County when I was a teenager. Um, and so I think investing in young people is the best investment that we can make. And that's, that's our time and our knowledge and supporting them and their work. Um, the big love of my life is working with students. And I don't teach in a formal way, but there isn't a day that goes by that I don't work with students. And, and that's very important. And I think it needs to be in, implicit in all of our lives that we support and mentor and encourage other people. So um, lead, be led, teach, and learn. And the, the phrase when I think about this is Gwendolyn Hall Venoni. And she works with me in my 4-H program in Ventura County. When I started in the uh, summer of 1992, um, Gwendolyn was a 4-H all-star in Ventura County. She was tasked my first day. I started the week of the Ventura County Fair. Um, that's, a, that's a really challenging week to start as a 4-H advisor. And she was tasked with taking me around and introducing me to people. And then she was the one who taught me all about science-based inquiry and just a, a fabulous teacher. And then she, she went away to college, and, and she had another career, and she's recently come back to us in providing leadership for our community club program. And what the, the best lesson that I get from her is I see these people who were her leaders when she was in 4-H, who've been 4-H leaders for 40 and 45 years, and they're allowing themselves to be led by her, and I allow myself to be led by her. I defer to her judgment. And I think that that is a really important characteristic of good leaders, is to lead, but also to be led, to teach, but also to allow yourself to learn, and to try to learn something every day. So, um, my last point is about perspective. So again, as an historian, I study time, the trajectory, 
And I understand that our work around sustainability, that it's, it's urgent and it's acute, but it's not going to be accomplished in our lifetimes. And I had an interesting experience. Um, when I travel, I always try to meet people. I always try to meet people. And I met four new people before lunch. And they were all great. Um, but the woman that I met this morning, and she was so great that I said, can we have breakfast together at the airport? Because we're on the same flight. And her name is Mrs. Flynn. And um, when she got into the shuttle after me, we started talking, and she mentioned her name was Flynn. And I said, well, you wouldn't want the, the Flynn family of farmers. And it turned out that she was. So her family came from Ireland to Ventura County, um, probably in the 1870s, um, and farmed. And we talked about where they had farmed um, in the county. The land's very expensive there now, so some of her children have come up and um, are farming in the Visalia area. Um, and it was really wonderful talking to her. She'd just come back from Ireland, where she'd gone to visit the ancestral family farm. But what um, sort of the perspective that I got from that is we determined pretty quickly that, that we weren't related, but uh, the consensus that we came to over scrambled eggs at the airport was that actually maybe our common genealogy was commitment to land and to agriculture and to sustainability. And, and that was my good perspective from the day. So um, I want to thank you very much. Um, it's really nice to meet you. Thank you very, very much. to publicly announce the recipient of the award. Each year we also feature speakers who themselves display the leadership and qualities of the people that we're here to honor. So this is opportunity to reach a little further outside the UC family. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Craig McNamara. Craig is a graduate of UC Davis. Uh, he's an organic farmer here in this area. He's the owner of Sierra Orchards and co-founder with his wife, Julia, of the Center for Land-Based Learning. And Center for Land-Based Learning helps high school students build greater social and human capital within their communities through experience in sustainable agriculture. Craig is president of the California State Board of Food and Agriculture, serves on the UC President's Advisory Commission on Agriculture and Natural Resources, and on the UC Davis Dean's Advisory Council. He's also on, a member of the advisory board of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute and is very active in American Farmland Trust, Roots of Change, and the Public Policy Institute of California. Craig and Charlie Rominger knew each other well. And the amphitheater at the Center for Land-Based Learning is named in Charlie's honor. So it's a great pleasure to welcome a, a great friend of California of agriculture, friend of the University of California, friend of ASI, Craig Mack. Thank you, Tom, for those very generous words, and uh, thank you all. Now, it's going to take a little crossover here. We've worked on this uh, to see if we could switch slide projections here, so if you'll bear with us one second. Uh, this is not my forte, but I'm sure we're going to have success. And then we'll get this next presentation up. Rose, that was absolutely wonderful. And um, I, too, had a Coach Honeycutt um, who's, who taught me so much in life. And uh, I value those lessons over and over again, so I can only imagine what that meant for you. But I can't tell you um, how excited and honored I am to be 
here with you today in this great celebration of, of two very important visionary pioneers that um, taught us a tremendous amount. Um, I spent a lot of time with Charlie and uh, just learned so much. Uh, there was a quote um, that said, he sensed that people need room to change their mind. And he was also open and willing to change his own mind. And I think that quote uh, serves us so well. So thank you for uh, asking me, Tom, and the family members to be here to join you today. So I wanted to share with you and explore a little bit with you about the tremendous challenges and opportunities that we as Californians face today, and we as eaters and citizens of this remarkable state. And in Washington, D.C., and across the nation, this year began with the dire prediction of a fiscal cliff and the realities of a sequester. And yet, as dire as those predictions really were and are that we're living with today, I think the cliff that remains out there that we should really be concerned about is the food cliff. And the food cliff is a perfect storm that consists of climate change on a national and global basis, global food insecurity, and depleted global resources. And, and you and I are experiencing this uh, across California. We're launching into our second phase of a drought, uh, very significant. Um, I haven't been here as long as several of the families that I'm uh, looking at today, but in my 40 years, I've never seen an April and a May like this, um, where the winds have been so consistent. And in terms of global food insecurity, you're aware of the fact that over a billion people today are, are chronically ill, face chronic malnutrition, earning less than $1.25 a day. This is something that in our lifetimes, we have to have to change. It can't go on. And in terms of our resources, seven of the last eight years, globally, we've consumed more food than we've produced. So I think we really are facing this cliff, and I think we have to figure out how are we going to change, and how are we going to change today in our habits, our national habits, and our global habits. I think one of the models that we can use for this change is the sustainable agricultural model. And as many of us as there are in the room today, I'm sure there are as many definitions of sustainability. One that you're familiar with and one that I'm familiar with are the three Ps, um, which we think of as a sustainable agriculture is one that uh, promotes a, a healthy food system for the people who are farming, the planet that we farm with, and the profit. So by the people, I mean the farmers and the farm workers, so that we can ensure health and, and homes and education. When we talk about the planet, it's trying to bring the planet into balance. As a farmer, I think my greatest resource is our soils and what I can do and the tools that we can use together to, to create a healthy planet. And of course, a profit. I think that every conscientious farmer across the globe should be one who's, who's earning a profit. So I wanted to take just a moment and introduce you to our sustainable operation right down the road, 15 minutes from here, Sierra Orchards. And as you know, we are in one of these remarkable climates. There are only five of them, Mediterranean climates in the world, with rich resources. It's what drew me to this area. What I, I, when I graduated from this wonderful university, I had a Datsun pickup truck and a soil auger, and I drove this zigzag across the United States, looking at farms, hoping to buy one along the way, realizing that the best farm was right here. The best resources are in this college. And we are number one globally, as you all know. Thank God. But in this beautiful bounty, this area, I want to remind you, in 30 minutes, as we were this morning, Rich Rominger and I, and I'm sure Corny was there, in the state capitol, 30 minutes away, in a short time we can be at UC Berkeley, uh, we can be in the Bay Area, and 10 million people reside in this area. So we have this bucolic, incredible resource, but it is growing and the pressures will be significant. I just wanted to mention that although I'm certified organic, our goal is to be uh, sustainable in all of our practices, whether it's our production practices, our conservation, or our education. We've been very fortunate in the greater winters area. We have a stream keeper. We've learned a tremendous amount from Rich Maravich. We've garnered many matching funds, funds from USDA. So we've been able to invest in the removal of, endangered, of, of, of invasive species. We've been able to uh, refurbish our waterways. In terms of education, as you mentioned, Tom, we've been able locally and regionally and statewide to create programs that really focus on the next generation of decision makers, our high school kids, to help them 
become good stewards of these, uh, of these uh, natural resources that we all share. So a basic sustainable system, organic system. I know from my studies of plant and soil science that walnuts need 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. They don't differentiate between oil-based or synthetic fertilizers or manure or, or, or uh, leguminous crops. So we've gone to an entire fertilization program of cover crops with, with uh, vetch and compost, a green chopped compost. We bring in about 1,000 tons a year, spread that on. We've removed tillage from our operation, gone to a mowing operation, and of course we incorporate the highest and best technologies to take care of our pests. We use uh, pheromones and mating disruption. And of course water. Our governor and our state and our legislature and we as citizens are focused and have to focus on how to best conserve water in this state of ours. And we have challenges ahead of us, the likes of which even the Romagers haven't seen before, I think, <laughs> in, in this future. But whatever we can do in terms of uh, drip irrigation, berry drip is what we're doing on the farm. And many of you, many of you in this uh, uh, room have been out to the farm, participated in establishing these hedgerows. You know, some of us remember uh, that secretary under Nixon, Earl Hudson, I think Earl said, we must farm from fence post to fence post and roadway to roadway. And maybe he was right at a time for a reason in that epoch and maybe he wasn't. I think what we did was we reduced our biodiversity and we lost a lot of our insectaries and our habitats for what we know today are so important. I think it's quoted that 30% of our beverages and foods globally are pollinated by native pollinators. So when we put in a hedgerow that has flowering crops in January all the way through the year, that's creating a habitat for, for our, our pollinators. So as productive as America's farmers have been in feeding America, we have something very, uh, we have a very large problem in food insecurity. And food insecurity is such that um, today, 50 million Americans do not know where their next meal is coming from, and the majority of those are children. And this, in this great country of ours, in this great state of ours, where we're providing over 50% of the nation's fresh fruits and vegetables, we provide over 17% of the nation's exports um, out of the United States, we cannot afford to let uh, food insecurity uh, uh, stop us from feeding our people in this country. It's a grave, grave problem, and one that I know, I know we can deal with and I know we can solve. On this, at the same time as we're facing food insecurity, we have a tremendous problem with food waste. And I'm talking about food waste from farm to table. We are, it's, a, it's a, uh, said in a survey by the NRDC that we're wasting 40% of our, our food. And it just makes no sense. It doesn't make any economic, environmental, and it certainly does not make any uh, ethical sense. And remind you, I'll remind you, this is from farm to table. And just think of what it takes us to get food to the table. 50% of our arable land across the nation, 10% of the energy budget in the United States, and we swallow up 80% of our fresh water in doing so. So if we're wasting food, we're wasting resources. And we're wasting it about, about $165 billion per year. So we're throwing out water. And when we throw away waste, food waste, by and large, it goes to a landfill, and that creates methane. And methane, as you know, is one of the most severe greenhouse gases that we have. So we're also throwing away our energy when we do this. And as I mentioned, it does occur from farm to table. I've taken this uh, picture of leafy greens, probably in the Salinas Valley, just as an example of what happens uh, across our commodities. And as you know, we grow 400 different crops in California. But globally, what happens is a farmer, he or she may anticipate what the market for leafy greens will look like three or four months from now. And maybe that market will not materialize, so you've overplanted. So automatically, you've got an oversupply, and you might not be able to disk in your, you may not be able to market your crop, and therefore have to disk it in. In addition to cosmetically inferior product, this is an example of Harvesters going through, they're cutting off the leafy green, packing it into your fresh pack, getting it into refrigeration. But we also have concurrent packing operations right now. These are operations that the farmer will utilize on that same picking rig. There will be boxes to put that second degree product into, that cull product. We now have farm uh, food banks that are all 
ready to pick that product up at the edge of the field, put it into refrigerated trucks, and get it to the people who need it the most. This is a win-win. This is something that Ocean Mist, our friends, my friend and fellow ag leadership uh, colleague, Joe Pizzini at Ocean Mist is doing. This is something that we can do. One of the things that we've done at the State Board of Food and Agriculture is to uh, support legislation that provides a tax incentive for farmers who are donating foods to food banks across California. There's a 10% there's a uh, tax incentive today. I'd like to see that to be 25%. I think we can afford that, and I think that would assist farmers. We're missing out on food when it gets to the retail and wholesale areas. When I go to buy a strawberry or peach or uh, a nice looking tomato and I put it into my basket, the one that I don't pick that has a blemish probably ends up going into the store's waste. The average grocery store is throwing out 600 pounds of food per day. The majority of that has been going to landfills. And you know from my last slide what that means. We, we just can't afford to do that any longer. So we do have um, stores like Andronicos in California who are trying a program called Food Star. This, they tried this out in the fall last year with uh, Pink Lady Apples. Certain uh, fields of Pink Lady didn't really pink enough, and so they really couldn't market it as a classy Pink Lady. It was going to go into candied apples um, for Halloween. Didn't make that cut either. These were going to go into either an animal feed or into compost or into the trash chain. So the store started a program. They would box them up in the bins in front of the store, shine them up, make them look good, discount the price, and give an added advantage to the, to the shopper. And it was very, very successful without cannibalizing the apples inside the store. So we need to re-educate and think of ways that we can do things that will um, promote our, our best interest. The other thing I know in West Sacramento, there's a company called um, California Safe Soil that is taking uh, grocery store waste and through an anaerobic situation composting it and making it available. When we then we throw things away um, in, the, in the food service line. And this is a, a double tragedy because we're throwing packaging materials away as well. And I, I, I saw an interesting fact. When we throw away a product that has an egg in it, or several eggs, it took something like 40, 36 gallons of water to produce an egg. It takes 146 gallons of water to produce an ear of corn and 1,800 gallons of water to produce a pound of beef. So I think we really need to be cognizant of food waste in our homes. And then I don't know about you, but I'm totally flummoxed by expiration dates. If there are volunteer programs that stores use, I think it was for a good reason, but I'm not sure it's serving us well. I know when I go into my refrigerator and I see the yogurt that says uh, May 1st, uh, I should probably sniff it, taste it, see if it's good or not, but typically I'll, I'll throw it out. So we have sell by, best by, use by. I think we're very confused. And it's, it, we need to insist that our grocery stores help us out here or, or help them to uh, make this more uniform. And maybe your refrigerator looks a lot like mine, but when it looks like that, it then looks like that, and then it gets thrown out. And the average family in the United States of four people is, is, is throwing out between $1,000 and $2,000 worth of food a year. So this is something that we, that we really, really need to focus on. If we can reduce our food waste from farm to table, from 40 to 25%, we would enable ourselves to feed an additional 25 million people in this country. I think that's worth it. I think that's something that we can afford to do. I wanted to show this slide of our global partners. We know that in the United States, we spend less than 10% of our disposable income on food. We know that our neighbors to the south, Mexico, and probably uh, Canada to the north is on the 22, 25%. But look at our neighbors all the way around the world, in India and Kenya, whose populations are probably 50% farmers, and they're spending between 35 and 45% of their disposable income on food. And I think they're also suffering tremendous food waste because of lack of transportation, refrigeration, and some of the post-harvest physiology. So this is, this is a problem that's shared globally. And it gets me to the point that we do have planetary boundaries. And, and we have to start living within our planet's operating space when it comes to food or air or, or our emissions. And it has huge social and cultural implications. Um, 
If people are hungry, malnutritious, and starving, I think it creates wars and dysfunction across our society. So what are some of our solutions? To me, compromise. Compromise is something that we have to do. I feel on water, on the delta, on the conveyance systems, I'm going to have to give up 50% of what I think I want. Because in this room, we're not all going to agree on how to get to where we want to get to. I like this slide because I took both pictures. On the, on the left is a large river that I use to prepare our soil, to prepare it for planting of walnuts. And on the right is Michael Pollan, who comes up occasionally to turn some of our compost piles. So we cannot <laughs> let big ag and little ag divide us. We need ag. We need all of that. If we're, you know, I think we're curling towards that nine billion figure at 125,000 people a day. We're grown, and we've got all these mouths to feed. I'm an organic grower. I believe that organics is a piece of a much larger puzzle. One of the things I'm very proud about is what we've been able to accomplish at the State Board of Food and Agriculture over the last several years with Corny's help, all of your help. We have come up with an Ag Vision 2030 statement which sets forth 12 strategies. And I think you would agree with all of them. And this is California agriculture coming together at its best. And of three of these 12, I want to focus on the next generation of farmers, the fact that we need to improve access to healthy, sustainable food, and regulation. So food access. We have not been doing a good job in uh, encourage, encouraging our citizens to utilize SNAP, uh, which is the former food standards. And one of the reasons was finger imaging. In order to receive SNAP, you had to have uh, finger imaging. We were able to vote that down in, in the legislature, and now um, many more people, are 7% more, are utilizing SNAP. We've been missing out on $3 billion worth of federal money because we are the 48th lowest uh, state in the nation for SNAP utilization. We have farmers across California have made a have made a effort to raise foods for California food banks. We've committed 100 million pounds. Last year, I think we were at 125 million, and we'd like to get to 200 million pounds of donated foods. And I like this last idea. Let's think of farms as pharmacies and food as Rx. Don't we believe that? Don't we believe that our food choices are going to affect us and our society and how we accomplish what we want to do? Regulation. Every farmer will say, darn regulation. Well. <laughs> Regulation is something that has also gotten us to be a global player. And so I think at the, at the State Board and on the Ag Vision, what we'd like to do is ease the burden of regulation while maintaining our environmental standard. So you can see there, regulation costs the state a lot of money. Why don't we spend our time building relationships, incentivizing beneficial practices, and get to a point um, where we can uh, ease the burden of regulation. And then the need for new farmers. Secretary Vilsack has said we need 100,000 new farmers, and we probably need them in the next few years. Where are they going to come from? Many of us are now, the average age of the California farmer is over 60 years old. There's a tremendous interest on the parts of many of you in this room to get engaged in, in agriculture. And you can see those statistics there. They don't look too good. And the last one is very disconcerting, that 90% of us don't have an exit strategy. We don't have a succession plan, and we need to be doing this right now. So what's the hope? The hope for me is that although it's slow and the process is lengthy, that our leaders nationally, we have a lady, a first lady in, in, in the White House who I think sincerely cares about changing um, uh, our food, our national policy. We have a governor here in the state of California who is very sincere. Uh, this morning, several of us in this room attended the host breakfast in in, San, in uh, Sacramento, and the, the governor ended his speech on water. And I think he understands it. I think we need to work together. I, when I look at you in this room, I see the power that we have, and we just have to get out there and make change. So I congratulate you all. I congratulate the families. It's so wonderful to be here. Rose, welcome on a tremendous um, award. Very deserving, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much.